In The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, Link needs to save Termina from an impending collision with that planet's malevolent moon. But what if I told you that the so-called moon is really a black hole? Majora's Mask is probably the darkest game in the Zelda series. For the unfamiliar, here's a plot recap to bring you up to speed. Link arrives in Termina, a province on a planet whose moon is on a three-day collision course with the surface. Now the planet doesn't seem to have a name, so I'll just refer to the whole place as Termina. The approaching moon causes all kinds of havoc. It has a crazy face, complete with teeth, and in true Zelda fashion, it can only be stopped by Link. So clearly, Majora's Mask has some fantastical and unrealistic elements. But that doesn't mean that it can't serve as a springboard to talk about some really interesting physics. In fact, the basic physics of Majora's Mask has been analyzed before, both by a thread on Reddit and by MatPat on an episode of Game Theorists. But both of them overlooked a detail that punches a major hole in their conclusions. And by hole, I mean black hole. Today, I'm gonna argue that the moon in Majora's Mask is not a moon at all, but instead a rocky shell surrounding a miniature black hole. Now before I justify this bold claim, let me clarify that I'm not dissing on either that Reddit poster or on MatPat. Both analyses are extremely well done, and I'm actually gonna rely on MatPat's measurements in this episode. As we'll see, the oversight in question is subtle. I even made it myself at first. The reason I'm doing this episode at all is that dissecting that oversight gives us a chance to explore some often unappreciated features of how gravity works. And it gives us a chance to talk about miniature black holes, which I'm super pumped to have discovered lurking in a Zelda game. So let's get started. The root of the problem with both these other analyses is that they assume Termita's moon has the same density as our moon, and that's impossible. For reasons I'll explain shortly, Anything with the density of Earth's moon would be ripped apart if it got within 12,000 kilometers of Earth's surface. The same would be true on Termina, no matter what non-absurd radius and mass we assign to that planet. So getting this close with only that density is simply out of the question. Okay, so how dense is Termina's moon? Fortunately for us, the game offers an indirect way to estimate its value. The key evidence appears in the scenes just before the moon hits, when loose rocks start flying upward off the surface of the planet. You might think this implies that the gravitational pull on the rocks due to the moon exceeds the gravitational pull from the planet itself, but that's not correct. What has to beat the planet's gravity in this case to make the rocks levitate is something called the moon's tidal force. This requires some explanation. Rocks on the surface of Termina are being pulled towards the moon, but the planet is also being pulled towards the moon, chasing after those rocks. Since the rocks are closer to the moon, where the moon's gravity is stronger, they do accelerate towards the moon slightly more quickly than the rest of the planet does. Now on its own, this differential acceleration tends to separate rocks from the planet, even on the side of the planet opposite the moon. I mean, think about it. Rocks on the far side of the planet accelerate toward the moon even less quickly than the center of the planet does, so they would also have a tendency to leave the planet's surface. From Termina's point of view then, the moon's tidal force manifests itself as an outward push off the planet's surface, at least along the planet-moon line, kind of like anti-gravity. Ordinarily though, that outward push is tiny, so tiny that a planet's own gravity is more than enough to hold things in place. For instance, the tidal force from Earth's moon on you, right now, is about 10 million times smaller than Earth's pull on you. That's why you don't levitate during a full moon. Of course, if you bring the moon closer, on Earth or on Termina, the tidal force from the moon will increase. The question is, will it be enough to lift rocks? On Earth, absolutely not. But what about on Termina? I worked out the algebra using MatPat's measurement of a mere 30-ish meters for the radius of Termina's moon, and I put some lower limits on the radius of the planet based on the fact that we don't see its horizon curving in the distance. You can click over here to see the details, but here's the bottom line. If Termina's moon really were only as dense as Earth's moon, its tidal force, when hovering just above the planet's surface, would be 200,000 times smaller than the moon's current measly tidal force on you. At worst, it would raise the ocean levels on Termina by a hundredth of a millimeter. There's no way it would cause earthquakes, and it certainly wouldn't cause rocks to levitate. But in the game, the rocks do levitate, and that requires Termina's moon to be, wait for it, between a billion and a hundred trillion times denser than Earth's moon. Depending on whether you think the tidal force is just whipping the rocks upward with hurricane force winds, or actually lifting them directly. This high density would help explain why Termina's moon is even still in one piece. After all, the planet also exerts a tidal force on the moon, which is what would rip Earth's moon apart if it got too close to us. So, a trillion times the density of Earth's moon. That's ridiculous. It's beyond insane. It's the equivalent of cramming 20 million African elephants into a thimble. 
The only solid macroscopic objects in nature that are that dense are neutron stars. But here's the problem. Those objects can only get that dense in the first place because of their immense self-gravity. Even if you imagine some esoteric, unnatural way to synthesize a neutron star, theoretical estimates say that you'd still need at least a tenth of the sun's mass, give or take, to make one. Termina's moon, even at these densities, only weighs about half as much as Earth's moon. Granted, that's a quadrillion times more massive than MacPat's estimate, but still millions of times less than what you'd need to make a pure neutron star. So if it's not a neutron star, how can Majora's Moon be so dense? Well, maybe it's neutron star material, but only in the outer layers. If you could somehow put a much denser mass at the center, the material around it might have enough of a gravitational scaffolding, so to speak, to achieve neutron star densities with less mass than would normally be required. So to serve as a gravitational seed, we need something incredibly small and incredibly dense, even denser than a neutron star. Okay, what about condensing some of the necessary mass into a black hole. That black hole would end up having a radius less than a millimeter. Leave some empty space around it for good measure, and this might work. How could you ever make such a tiny black hole? Well, Hawking radiation for one. You could start with a more massive and larger black hole and just let it evaporate slowly. It would lose mass and size during the process, and about a gazillion years later, poof, moonish mass, submillimeter sized black hole. Piece of cake. So there's my argument. The moon in Majora's Mask is basically some super dense crust with teeth and with a mini black hole in the middle. Once you factor in tidal forces, I don't see how you avoid this conclusion. Granted, there are some loose ends. For example, gravity would be billions of times stronger on Termina's moon than on Earth. So how does Link get inside and survive the trip? Look, dude, I'm just a man, okay? I don't have all the answers. I just wanted to add a new twist to an old conversation about Majora's Mask. Maybe I also made a boo-boo. If I did, I'm sure you space timers will let me know. You know what to do. Dig into the comments or to Reddit and discuss. I'll report any interesting questions you come up with or conclusions you find on the next episode of Space Time. Last week, we talked about why the cosmic microwave background once made all of space orange. We're going to talk about that, but first, a quick announcement. On April 11th and 12th, I will be hosting part of NASA's International Space Apps Challenge, a global multi-city two-day hackathon where people, including students, can get together to collaborate on coming up with innovative uses for publicly available data. I will be hosting at the main stage in New York City, along with several astronauts. For more information and to register to participate, go to spaceappschallenges.org. And if you can't participate in person, you can do so virtually, and it will also be live streamed. Now, back to why space used to be orange. Knowledge Playlist asked, isn't the color of space cosmic latte? You're referring to a recent episode of It's Okay to Be Smart, where Joe Hansen explained that the average color of all visible stars in the universe comes out to an off-white called cosmic latte. The CMB is something else. Here in George and Sergio Garza were discussing whether water could have existed when space went dark. No, but not because of temperature or pressure issues. The problem is that there was no oxygen. Oxygen gets fused in the cores of stars. And as far as I know, the first stars didn't start forming until a couple of hundred million years or so after the sky went dark. KW83 said that I'm just too handsy on camera. What? Tharks asked whether given enough time, the CMB will eventually redshift into the FM radio band. As far as I know, unless I'm missing something obvious, yes. Gareth Dean pointed out that the early universe contains not just hydrogen, but also helium, and asked whether CMB analysis takes this into account. In more detailed treatments, absolutely. Look up recombination on Wikipedia. Now, what imprint that leaves on the CMB, I don't know off the top of my head, or even whether it's detectable, but it can't leave a zero signature. S.D. Marlowe asked how the CMB can look the same from all directions if we're not sitting at the center of the universe. Well, there is no center to the universe. The CMB was emitted from all points in the universe simultaneously. With each passing moment of time, any observer sitting anywhere will see photons that were emitted from progressively more distant locations. However, that's only if you're moving along with the overall cosmic expansion of space. The Earth has superimposed on that, a individual motion through the galaxy. And due to that individual motion, there is in fact a Doppler shift of the CMB. It looks bluer in the direction that we're moving and slightly redder from behind. All those maps that you see, the false color maps of the CMB, subtract this away, which is why you don't see it. Finally, Paul Anzel emailed me a calculation working out how much energy it would take to break Earth apart atom by atom. Yes, Paul, I got your email. No, I haven't had a chance to verify the calculations yet, but once I do, if they check out, I'll report the answers here on Space Time. Oh, <laughs>